Hey everyone, welcome to McBick. Uh, this is Pastor John. We're so glad that you could join us uh, with this worship service online. Um, and, and actually, it's really interesting because last week was the first week that we officially also had a live uh, worship service on Facebook Live at 9:30 in the morning, and we're also meeting uh, out at the near the pavilion. Uh, on Sunday mornings at 9.30 as well. So we're glad that you could take some time and join us here. I have a couple announcements as we begin. Uh, the first is our church directory. And if you have not gotten an email from Sherry Selkirk, our office administrator, uh, about a new church directory, please send an email with your current contact information. That would be uh, name, email, phone number, address to admin at McBick. Dot org. And you can see the email uh, listed right below me here, admin at mcbick.org. At McBick uh, the second announcement, uh, really excited to see this finally for children's ministry. Uh, mark your calendars for Sunday, August 9th. It's a couple weeks from today. Uh, Pastor Jen and others have been working behind the scenes to try to find a way to mitigate uh, so the social distancing issues with children's ministry. So uh, we're going to have a, a worship service for children outdoors starting August 9. And it's, it's going to be outdoors. And we want to invite uh, children and their parents to come and join for about uh, around 45 minutes starting at 1045 every Sunday. So worship service from 930 to around 1030. And then the children's ministry from uh, 1045 till around maybe 1130 or so. If you are seeing this announcement and have not been able to attend a Sunday morning worship service at McBick, want to invite you to consider bringing your children, uh, bring the masks and all that. Um, but but there will be times where where children can interact with some things that are being presented to them and parents can be with them too. More information is, is coming, but I just want you to all be aware of that. Please mark your calendars for that. Today we're going to hear from Pastor Evan as he continues in our sermon series entitled Alive in Christ. And he's going to be covering uh, the end of Colossians 1 into the beginning of Colossians 2. Looking forward to a really good morning for all of us. Let's pause and let's ask the Lord to bless our time together, shall we? Jesus, we thank you that in the midst of all that's going on in our life, all that's going on in our community, all that's going on in our country and nation and world, that you are Lord over all. You're the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. You have us in mind. We are your children. We thank you, God, for bringing us to this place where we can set aside the cares and concerns that we have. We can focus our attention on you. I pray, Lord, today that as we worship you, uh, you would impact our heart, our mind, our will, our emotions. And Father, I pray your blessing over Pastor Evan as he speaks. Pray that uh, the words that you've laid on his heart would challenge us and enable us to grow as followers of Jesus. Uh, today, we also pray for all of the discontent that we see in our country. We pray for your peace, Lord Jesus. You are the Prince of Peace. And so today, uh, as we worship, as we give, as we listen, as we respond, may you be glorified. May you be honored in our worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forever is built on nothing less my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Sing that again, Christ alone, Christ alone. Oh, may I 
are they in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless in before the throne sing Christ alone Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord the Lord of all Sing this out Christ alone Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love Today we're going to continue to work our way through the book of Colossians as part of our Alive in Christ series. Our passage for this morning spans from the end of chapter 1 through the beginning of chapter 2. And we're going to read that in just a second, but before we do that, I just want to give a little refresher, a little context for the book of Colossians and where we are in this series. Colossians, what we call a book of the Bible, was really just a letter written to the group of Jesus followers in the city of Colossae. And this group of Jesus followers had just recently come to faith. And Paul, who's writing to them, who's actually never met them, he's writing to them from prison. And he, he writes to them for two reasons. One, to just encourage them in their early stages of faith. But then two, just to share some foundational truth that would be important for any new believer. The first half of chapter one, which we looked at, two weeks ago. It's a typical greeting to a church where Paul, uh, it just encourages the people for their faith, for their hope, and for their love, and then just shares a prayer of blessing over the community. The second half of chapter one, which we looked at last week, is this kind of majestic, awesome, soaring poem about the supremacy of Christ, about how Jesus is the way that we understand God. Literally, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. To see what God is like, we look to Jesus. And that brings us to today's passage, which starts in chapter 1, verse 24, and then goes through chapter 2, verse 5. So let's read this. Paul says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ." That continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I want you to know how much I've agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie, all, in him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you're living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. 
There's a lot packed into these verses, but I want us to focus this morning on just three verses in particular. And the first one is verse 24. Paul says, I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. Now, Paul is doing two things here in sharing this. First, very practically, he's just letting the church know that, hey, don't worry about my suffering. Remember, Paul is in prison. Um, I'm actually glad about it. I'm actually glad for my suffering because it means that because I am suffering, you guys aren't. In other words, Paul is saying because the people who are persecuting the church have focused all their energy and attention on containing him and keeping him at bay, um, they haven't been focusing their attention on these younger, newer communities of followers of Jesus. Paul is basically act, acting as a distraction so that these new, young churches can flourish. And so on the surface, that's what Paul is sharing. But beneath the surface, he's communicating some important values that are a part of the kingdom of God that should accompany a follower of Jesus. And the first one is this, that the good of someone else is worth my suffering. That's not a popular opinion, is it? In a world that, that's constantly shouting at us, live a life that makes you happy, do what makes you comfortable, don't let anyone tell you what to do. In our hyper-individualized, self-serving culture, that's the motto. I shouldn't have to suffer so that someone else can flourish. But in the kingdom, that's not how it works, says Paul. In the kingdom, you know, participating in God's way of living, someone else's good, someone else's safety, someone else's protection is actually more important than my own. If I were to flip my Bible just one page to the left, I'd land in Philippians chapter 2, where Paul lays it out even more obviously. He says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I don't know about you, but there's a lot happening in the world that might tempt me to value myself over others instead of vice versa. We're being asked to not see our friends, to wear an uncomfortable mask, to, to stay, go out of our way to stay six feet from people, to cancel our vacations. You can fill in the blank. There's a lot being asked for us, and it's only natural for our reaction to be, you know, that, that doesn't make me happy. Um, that makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. But what the kingdom reaction says is, okay, that doesn't make me happy. That makes me uncomfortable. But someone else's good is worth my suffering, if we can even call it suffering. Um, someone else's needs are more important than my own. And so not only is suffering for someone else's good a value in the kingdom, suffering just in itself, even if it's not for someone else's good, is a value. In Romans chapter 5, we read this, a familiar verse. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Suffering, to whatever degree it comes in, is a catalyst. It's a cause for change. It's a, a spark plug for something new. And as Christians, we pledge allegiance to a, to a man who claimed that the horrific suffering that he faced on the cross was for the good of someone else, for the good of the world. And the suffering that Jesus faced on the cross was not the end of the story. In fact, it was just the catalyst for new life and new creation that would be birthed three days later as Jesus rose. Suffering is never easy. It's never fun. It's never enjoyable. But like Paul in this passage and like we see in the life of Jesus, we can be glad for it, glad for suffering because of what's on the other side of it. The second verse I want us to hone in on from this passage is verse 25. 
Paul says this, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. Now, at, at first glance, this verse seems kind of underwhelming and maybe insignificant. But if we consider who's writing the letter, Paul, and his story prior to encountering Jesus, the verse takes on a new meaning. We learn from scripture that Paul, before he met Jesus, was a devoted Jew, a Pharisee who was zealously committed to the law, and he was a persecutor of Christians. Paul himself says in Galatians chapter 1, You've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, and I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Again, in 1 Timothy, Paul says about himself, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. That was Paul's story for, for quite some time. He was a persecutor of the church. But here in verse 25, we now find that Paul has accepted the responsibility of becoming a servant of the church. Because of this powerful, unexpected encounter that Paul has with Jesus, Paul moves from a persecutor to a servant, from an abuser to a protector, and from a, a threat to an advocate. It's a, a beautiful turnaround, an incre incredible testament to the grace and the love of Jesus that he would look around for someone to serve his church. He would search for a partner, a co-worker, if you will. And in doing that, Jesus didn't choose the one who understood God most clearly or the one who was without sin or the one who never let God down. Instead, God chose the most unexpected, the most far from God, most sinful person you could think of. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news for us that Jesus isn't in the business of partnering with those who are the most deserving of it? In the, the four Gospels and really the entire story of Scripture, we read that God over and over again, he chooses the least qualified and the, the most insecure to accomplish his purposes. I'm glad about that. I'm glad that Jesus would be willing to work with someone like me, someone like you, someone like us. And as I was thinking about this incredible change that Paul went through and experienced, I knew there were other stories like it. It wasn't the last time when it happened to Paul. And so I asked some of my friends, what stories, what people do you know of, um, of this sort of life change that Paul experienced? And so these are some of the, the responses that I heard. Lee Strobel, he was a, a former investigative journalist and a bitter atheist. He went out to a prove the absurdity of Christianity, but instead he found great evidence for God and he now travels the world proclaiming Jesus as Lord. Ohad Shaul, he was a committed participant in the human trafficking industry, but he now lives his life working with vulnerable youth to prevent them from entering into the trafficking industry. Chuck Colson, who was President Richard Nixon's kind of right-hand man, he was imprisoned for his role in the Watergate scandal. But he then went on to start Prison Fellowship, the world's largest Christian outreach to those in the prison system. Chantal, who was a Rwandan woman who lived through the Rwandan genocide in 1994, she eventually met and forgave the man who killed her father. And now the two of them, Chantal and John, they now travel around speaking about forgiveness and reconciliation. See, it's one thing to serve a group of people, but it's something totally different to serve that group of people after you had spent so much time and energy abusing that group of people. But that's who God is. That's how the kingdom of God works. God is the, the king reconciler, turning persecutors into servants. And so as any good applicator of scripture would do, it would make sense for my next question to be of you, are we servants of the church or are we persecutors of the church? Um, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that while we might not all be flawless saints, um, 
most of us are probably also not persecutors of the church. So instead, I'm going to frame the question this way. Are we servants of the church or are we consumers of the church? I think that's a much more timely question to ask of us living in the 21st century. Are we servants of the church or consumers of the church? Do we approach church with this kind of gimme gimme attitude that says, what can I get out of it? How can it help me? How will it make my life better? What ex sort of experience will it give to me? Don't get me wrong. The church will provide those things for you. Being part of this global family of followers of Jesus, it, it comes with great unmatched benefits. It will give to you. It will help you. It will make your life better at times. But at the end of the day, is that what we're in it for? Are we part of this church, little c, here at McBick, and part of the global church, big C, because of what it can give to us, or, like Paul, because of what we can give to it, to serve Jesus and to serve his people? In John F. Kennedy's 1961 inaugural address, he made this famous statement. He said, ask not what you're what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Now, this comment might have had all sort of political undertones that I'm not aware of, but on the surface, it's a powerful statement. And if, if we look at that statement and replace the word country with church, I think we have a beautiful motto. Ask not what the church can do for you, but what you can do for the church. What gifts character traits, passions has God given you that can be used to serve his church. Last verse from this passage, passage that I want us to drill down into, it comes from chapter 2, starting in, in verse 1. Paul again, I want you to know how much I've agonized for you. For many other believers who have never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie all the treasures, in him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In other words, Paul is saying, there's a lot of new believers who I've never met. And if I could share with them just one thing, it would be this. Jesus is God's plan. In Jesus, you'll find everything you need, all wisdom and all knowledge. Now again, Paul is addressing a very practical issue that the church at Colossae was dealing with. But in doing so, he's getting at a much, again, much deeper truth of the kingdom. So practically speaking, the Colossian church, simply by nature of their cultural context, they would have been surrounded by all sorts of pagan practices that search for wisdom and knowledge in other places, in false gods, in fortune tellers, in mystical exercises and, and stuff like that. But Paul says, says to the people at Colossae, don't worry about all of that stuff. You don't need it. You'll find everything you need to know in relationship with Jesus. You don't need all of that stuff. And so that's the practical issue. But the deeper truth that Paul talks about, he talks about it using the language of treasure, treasures. Now, everyone's familiar with a good treasure hunt story, right? Whether it was a pirate-themed scavenger hunt you did at a seven-year-old's birthday party, or a Dora the Explorer episode, or the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, we all have an idea of how a good treasure hunt story goes. First, it's revealed that there's some great hidden treasure to be found, Second, some cryptic, mysterious map is provided. Third, in following that map, the characters face all sorts of difficulties and challenges. And then last, in the end, the ultimate treasure is found and all is good and well. But Paul's treasure hunt story, if you will, here in Colossians 2, it goes a little differently. It goes like this. God's treasure at the end of the map is Christ himself. But the map to get there, the map to get to Christ, this mysterious plan, as Paul calls it, is also Christ himself. 
In true upside down kingdom fashion, we learn that Christ is the treasure and the map. This is the mystery of the kingdom, that Jesus is the directions and the destination. He's the trail and the target. And this is my favorite one. He's the blueprint and the booty. Okay. <laughs> Um, if you don't trust my pirate language, you could take it from Jesus himself. In John 14, close to the end of Jesus' time on earth, we read this. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As Jesus prepares his disciples for his departure from this earth, Thomas is confused and he pleads with Jesus saying, we, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. And Jesus responds to Thomas. He says, I'm the truth. No, I'm the treasure, but I'm also the way to the truth. I am the destination and the way to the destination, the treasure and the map. And so that's kind of like a Zen introspective way of understanding Jesus. But what does it mean for us today? What, like, why is that significant to us? And I'd say that it's significant because it reminds us that Christ in our life is not just a direction on the map to get to some greater goal. Jesus is not a means to an end. We don't commit our life to Jesus and to his church so that we can have some nice friends who will babysit our kids, or we can have some activities planned throughout the week to go to, or we can go on a nice vacation that we conveniently call a mission trip, right? We don't commit our life to Jesus in hopes that out of it we'll get a happy, fulfilling life. That, that might happen, but that's not why we follow Jesus. We follow Jesus. We commit our life to the roadmap of Jesus, because he is the treasure of ultimate worth. In him is everything we need. Fullness of life here on earth, but also the promise of life after this life that we know. Even if we didn't get the great benefits of following Jesus and being part of his church, would we still rejoice because of the treasure we had found? Or because the treasure had found us would maybe be more accurate. Would we find joy just in knowing Jesus, the author and sustainer of life? As we end, I want us to reflect on a question, and you can do this as the last worship song is playing. Paul, in this passage, he lays out three values of the kingdom that I shared. One, be glad in suffering because of the good that it is for someone else. Two, become a servant rather than a consumer of the church. And three, embrace Jesus as the entire treasure, not just a means to an end. And so my question for you to reflect on during this last song is, which of these three kingdom values do you most need to embrace in this season? Do you need to embrace being glad and suffering do you need to embrace being a, a servant of the church instead of a consumer? Or do you need to embrace Jesus as the entire treasure, not just a means to an end? So let me pray for us, and we'll spend some time reflecting on that. Jesus, thank you that you are the treasure of ultimate worth, that in you we find everything we need all wisdom and all knowledge and all life. Jesus, as we, as we reflect, God, would you reveal in us which of these values we need to embrace? How we might look at suffering differently, how we might understand our relationship with the church differently, how we might understand you, Jesus, as the treasure differently. So speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, God. Thank you for your grace and for your love that even when we don't get it right, you are there waiting for us with open arms and with love in your eyes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
bring you more than a song. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart I'm coming back and I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus Sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. Thank you guys. I hope you have a great week. I want to leave you with this verse that we read this morning. In Jesus lie all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I hope you're encouraged that in Jesus you have everything you need for a life of wisdom, knowledge, a life of love, a life of peace, and a life of joy. Bless you guys.